Okay, so we are recording. So the first question I've been asking people is just uh, how did you first get involved with Poe and Pints? And maybe if you want to speak more generally, just, you know, how did you start performing? Uh, how did you first get involved with performing? Sure. So um, I had done theater kind of off and on um, and even before that attended. So like when I was... Um, Gosh, even in elementary school, um, my family used to go up to Ashland for the Shakespeare Festival okay. um, in the summers and stuff like that. And then in kind of middle school, did a little bit of, you know, just kind of extracurricular theater. Um, there really wasn't a program necessarily. Um, at that point, we were living in Lovelock, small town, small school. Oh, so it wasn't like there was class, but there were, like I said, um, sort of extracurricular groups or, you know, we would kind of get together. So that in middle school, high school. Um, then in college, a little bit, again, not really necessarily like with classes, but um, just a, a little group, um, Steve Vincent Theater Guild, did a little, um, a few shows with them. Okay. Uh, after that, some work in um, in Reno, just with community theater, with Reno Little Theater, um, acting, and then ended up through someone else kind of doing um, sort of backstage a little bit, um, helping okay. out with Bruca. So, so yeah, and um, and gosh, there's I'm sure other stuff sprinkled throughout because I remember actually Bruca came to Lovelock at one point. So there's, you know, that's I knew them from that. And <laughs> so yeah, all these kind of things. But so did that, moved out here and was kind of out of it for a while. And then um first thing I did here was actually Poem Pints um 2019. Oh, okay. And you know, I think I had heard of it, but of of course tickets can be kind of hard to get a hold of and and yeah. um but uh saw something about auditions and was just like ah oh, well you know I'll go and if if nothing else I get kind of a sneak peek at at maybe you know some of the pieces or, or something like that so even if I don't get cast it'll be nice to kind of just check it out a little bit um so yeah I saw some some great people even at the audition was really impressed with the group um, ended up getting cast uh, and yeah gosh I just um, a tremendous tremendous group in in multiple ways so just a lot of of talent and just really great people you know outside of that just um, mm -hmm. you know fun and interesting and uh, yeah, just an amazing group, and and so felt very lucky to be a part of that. Uh, and then we hit a little, little bump with 2020 and and COVID, and then we were oh, shut sure. down, and um, and that was fine. But then came back in 21 and got to get a little bit deeper in. So that year, I cut a piece for the show. So that was. An, an extra little step and then um and then back again this year again cutting a piece and and acting and stuff so um yeah no a, a great group and kind of plan to stick with it if I can and yeah so hopefully that kind of answers uh yeah absolutely that. So, so by cutting a piece that just means you've been writing you've been on the writing side yeah, on the writing side so either sort of selecting a piece, you know, kind of submitting it for, for the group to kind of look at or, or kind of being handed one, however it works out. Um, and then taking it and just kind of adapting it for a more theatrical presentation. So okay. I actually have not done much of the hard work of that, to be quite honest, because last year's piece um, that I worked on was The Spider, and it ended up being just a lot of monologue because, you know, the spider doesn't talk. And so <laughs> he's just kind of talking the whole time. So, um, and then this year, one of the reasons I thought that uh, Monkey's Paw would be a good selection is, gosh, you know, it already had a lot of dialogue. There really wasn't 
much to do there versus, you know, uh, in a lot of the, the Poe stories, it's just him talking. And so to make it more theatrical, you've got to really pull it apart and, and find places for different people to be talking. Um, so I haven't done a lot of the hard work, I will say on that side of things, but um, yeah, for, for everybody else to kind of, they said crafting dialogue between characters when it's not written that way initially, um, yeah, is a lot of work for those folks for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so can you talk a little bit about just maybe sort of your individual process as a performer, and maybe now also as you're getting into more uh, writing, uh, just sort of how do you prepare for a role or a performance? Like, what are some things you do beyond just, you know, reading the script and <laughs> memorizing your lines? Right, and, and those are certainly foundational. And, and that does, I mean, that foundation then kind of frees you up to, to do more of the playing and getting in depth. And um so yeah, Derek had mentioned that we might talk a little bit about process, and I don't know that I've got like a specific process. Again, I don't really have like training necessarily, mm-hmm. just kind of stuff I've picked up. Um, so I don't know, in some ways, I was trying to think back, and um, sometimes it is just like a, a problem-solving thing, and, and I know that sounds a little odd, but like so my first year, one of the pieces that we did was um uh murder for crows um uh, the josh webster piece Mm -hmm. and um we had these great plague doctor masks but one of the things is is that covers up practically your whole face so what do you do to convey what you need to convey so you know what what options do i have left and it's like okay so you know we go hard into the voice because you still got that and then into you know, body motion and, and make sure that that can convey things um, now that they can't, you know, see your eyes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes it's, there's a, a technical challenge or something and you kind of have to just figure out, well, what can I still do and, and how do I make that work? Um, let's see. So like partially last year, also this year. Um, so in Legia, Last year, they ended up incorporating Conqueror Worm mm-hmm. um, and then doing Raven this year with the poetry and trying to make it, you know, not just a recitation or not just, and especially Poe is so strong yeah. into um, the meter and the rhyme and everything. And so- yeah. How do you dramatize that? Yeah, how do you dramatize, how do you, how do you maybe break out of what you know what might feel constraining or make it um something people can connect to so i think about this too with when we did bard in the yard and and shakespeare and Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people are intimidated by it or they're like well i you know i look at it i don't and it's like well it's it's meant to be heard so Mm -hmm. sometimes it's just um getting into the speaking so monkey's paw and um you won't notice it necessarily when you read it, but gosh, there's a bit at the end where, like, it's so, you know, syllabant. You hear these S's everywhere in that last paragraph, and, like, I wouldn't have noticed that if it wasn't out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so with the poetry, finding ways to to break kind of the meter, but lean into the meaning. So, because sometimes you know, to, to make it fit the meter or the rhyme, the, the sentence is a little bit contorted. So you can actually kind of untwist it and make yeah. it land where meaning says it should land. Um, the other thing I find really helpful in that case, and, and to some extent, generally with Poe, because we're in this sort of confined space, you know, we're not having elaborate sets and, and you know, super detailed props necessarily we've we've got things but um but leaning into that or even if it's you know there's no raven on stage but you have to know in your mind's eye exactly where it is or being very very anchored to things Mm -hmm. um and so yeah whether that's an object or just really anchoring to certain words and kind of making them concrete to yourself um i think helps to to get into it or, or sit in 
where you feel like you can convey things um, better to folks if, yeah. you, if you're really anchored. Yeah, so just thinking about some of the texts that you guys are working with uh, this year, Derek sent me a list, you know, so yeah, you mentioned The Raven, a couple of other works by Poe, I think The Black Cat, and maybe The Oval Portrait, a couple of short stories, but also right. uh, The Monkey's Paw, uh, a, love, a, a Lovecraft story, I think, mm -hmm. was in the list, and even a couple of poems by Robert Browning. So like, do you have any personal feelings towards Poe or any of these other authors? Like, do you have any kind of personal connections to any of these texts or just like what are your thoughts about the works themselves yeah absolutely so um kind of going back again um and I don't remember when but I was sure it was in high school or something like that and one of my major papers that I had to do was Poe because um okay. <laughs> yeah I just have always um in middle school I had to memorize something ended up doing the last two stanzas of the raven so uh, i was like well i got those two already so um so no i just you know that's sort of slightly dark or gothic or you know I, I i kind of adore those things anyway but uh so yeah very excited about about the project in that sense um poe lovecraft um and, and, and getting to pull, well, a number of things. So like I said, the, the spider was interesting because I had run into that in just a, a collection. Mm -hmm. And um, one that I don't assume a lot of people have necessarily run across versus um, Monkey's Paw, which kind of has the opposite thing of like, everybody thinks they know that story and they know the gist, right? Be careful what you wish for but um, may have forgotten the, the detail of just how devastating that is for, for parents or, or anyone to lose someone important to them and want them back, but they want them back the way they were, not right. how it's become. So um, yeah, I just uh, love any of that uh, kind of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, um, Browning again was just kind of going through stuff that's in the public domain and stuff like that and yeah. had happened upon back upon some poetry and stuff and it was like gosh you know the um blah. so my uh, the my last duchess has the the portraiture aspect which is kind mm -hmm. of the, the running theme Mm -hmm. I just loved that ending for uh, Porfiria's Lover where, you know, um, uh, they haven't stirred and, and yet God hasn't said a word. And, and so there's this, you know, so disturbing tableau and it's just kind of left there. And mm -hmm. um, I thought that might be kind of neat. So, yeah, it's been neat to just kind of dig through old stories and, and stuff like that and see what kind of jumps out both as as interesting and um, that you think you could make work in a sort of theatrical presentation so yeah 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 so Derek mentioned that you guys are kind of fusing uh, the oval portrait <laughs> with the Browning poems so so can you provide any sort of insight into that like like how exactly did did you guys go about doing that or sort of how did that process work yeah so so the so the pitch was kind of just, um, I kind of flew through, you know, a bunch of things that I'd come across that were interesting. And then when we were at the cutting crew meeting, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and talking about various pieces, um, and again, I don't know if, I think Frank maybe originally pitched, um, he had also uh, at one point wanted to incorporate uh, Sylvia Plath poem, but obviously that was not quite in um, public domain yet. But just that idea of, so we've, you know, we've got the, the idea at that time was, you know, you've got the woman in the oval portrait and um, the Plath poem would have been, you know, her side of things. So you kind of had his side coming in and then her side going out. Like you said, that didn't quite work, but then, um, I think I must have 
brought up Perpira's lover first. And then when we were talking, it's like, oh yeah, he also does have My Last Duchess, you know, speaking of portraiture and, and um, kind of murder and all the depraved things that we get into in the show. Uh, I was like, so maybe you could make that work. And so, yeah, it was just kind of talking and then um, Kelsey ultimately took it on and, and kind of trying to, to fuse all the pieces together and um, definitely a process on that one. It wasn't just, you know, take the text and, and cut it no. um, because there were so many pieces. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion and I'm sure a lot of playing around on her end trying to, to figure out how to meld those things together. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And yeah, I guess I can sort of get you out of here on this on this final question um, because yeah, I've been sort of talking about this with everybody so far. Like you know, Poe's language does pose some uh, challenges to readers, and you know, I teach Poe in some of my upper level uh, English classes. And yeah, he's he's hard even for advanced English students because the language is a little older. But it's like I've talked about with others, like people know his narratives, like they know mm -hmm. his stories, even if they haven't necessarily right. sat down and read them word for word. I mean, I still show the Simpsons, uh, <laughs> it's a, of, of their adaptation of the Raven. Tree House of Horror. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a little bit abridged, but it's actually a pretty good way for yeah. students to sort of first approach that, that difficult text. So, so yeah, this kind of a, kind of almost a paradox, like he's difficult, but he lives on and people still know his work. So what do you think it is about these stories, uh, that, that make them still resonate with modern audiences today? Hey, well, and then it's, it's, you know, so interesting when you kind of look at the, you know, initially he wasn't really known for his stories as far as what, you know, made him money, you know, was, was his other work. And, um, and it's funny that to us, that's all there is, right, is, is, you know, we don't care about the critics or, you know, anything else that he did. Yeah, he was a very important literary critic, yeah. Right, right, yeah. but like, no one cares about that. Yeah, um, but, so I, I don't know, well, and Gosh, I mean, yeah, everybody immediately goes to kind of the gothic and stuff like that, but, you know, invented the detective story. I mean, he was just so, no. um, so amazing. You know, and, and it's funny too, and the um, perception of his poetry is as the sort of dog girl or whatever, but um, he does such interesting things with it. And I don't know if it's, if it's because of the distance and then it sort of takes on excuse me <laughs> you know sort of this patina just just by the age you know that you know because it's old it it must be good or if people are still talking about it it must be good um but i don't know it's uh some of it i guess is still you know transgressive or or maybe even more so than it was at the time so like in black cat you know cutting out the cat's eye you know when people didn't care about animals maybe that actually wasn't as shocking as now people are are horrified you know that that <laughs> truly that story always gets them reaction. yeah so um so i don't know by by you know being willing to go into those darker aspects and you know everyone kind of wants to put the happy face and, and have the, you know, envious Instagram, you know, life story, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, by being, you know, writing as if someone is, is making these horrible confessions or, you know, describing these horrible ordeals. Um, yeah, and, 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 and kind of like in any horror, it's a safe way to explore those kind of psychological um, depths you know whether it's it's in yourself or or realizing that other people are capable of it or, or whatever it is but um you know people are are kind of fascinated by that that darker side of things um and want to look at it but again in a way that's safe so it's yeah. you know the roller coaster version of you know i get the excitement but i'm i'm locked into the car <laughs> so um yeah i don't know if it's just kind of feeding into to that kind of relationship for folks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And uh, do you have any final thoughts or anything in particular you're looking forward to coming up? Um, I mean, not, not really as far as like final thoughts. Um, 
I, happy to hear that you're going to be at opening night. So that's um, exciting. Yeah. Uh, always like to have new people involved, and I think that'll be great. Uh, and then, yeah, just interested to see, you know, what else we we end up with. I know they're working on some great things as far as um, incorporating a little bit of Alice in Wonderland into the whiskey tasting that's coming up and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, just an amazing group. And like I said, they always find neat ways of, of integrating some of these classics into to new life. And so yeah. it's great to be a part of. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, I'll be there on Thursday night. Uh, so, yeah, thanks again and um, have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, Sam. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.